it's working. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so thanks, for, thanks for the invitation to talk about my, my uh, research today. So I'm interested in um, particularly in how scholarship writing, scholarship publication, uh, can impact on uh, practitioner identity, and I'm going to report on some research which, which was carried out at a, a, a Russell Group University. Just by way of providing some context for this, um, we, we, we have a consensus, I think, within the sector that scholarship publication can give uh, credibility and status to um, people um, in, our, in our sector um, within the university sessions. They can provide uh, cultural capital and I think really importantly for us, um, the pu publication is something which is recognised in the, in the wider um, academy and uh, one of the dimensions I'm going to be looking at today in the research is how we position ourselves regarding the wider academy and the some of the beliefs that we have about um, publication and scholarship in the wider academy. So if you look at the TEEP uh, competence, uh, competences handbook, then we have this, I think, kind of quite useful quotation here. An EAP practitioner will recognize the importance of applying to their practice the standards expected of students and other academic staff whilst engaging individually and collaboratively in continuing professional development, research and scholarship in the TEEP discipline. So I included this because I think it's a reminder of how um, we're looking outwards um, as EAP practitioners to the wider university setting. One of the things I'm going to be looking at is how the, the, wide, the broader institutional context um, defines our professional identity and, um, and particularly going to be looking at the, the institutional culture and uh, as part of this I'll be looking at changes in the institutional culture within the, the context of my research. Um, the, as I'm looking at EAP practitioners who are entering into scholarship publication, it's worth just reminding ourselves, I mean, th this was from nearly a decade ago, but I think in many contexts it still holds reasonably true that there can often be a, a lack of culture of publication, of of um, practitioners automatically feeling that it's part of their responsibilities, um, whether contractually or within the general nature of activity in the setting. And um, if, if it's an area they're particularly interested in, um, Davis wrote a, a very good paper for, for Jeep, beginning to look at this and, and saying, look, this is an area that we particularly need to explore. So what I'm looking at today is it's part of a larger research project uh, that I carried out and today I just wanted to look at how um, the, the transition or the shift into scholarship writing can impact on professional identity and as part of this um, looking also at how uh, EAP practitioners ideas of expectations which are placed on other academics in the academy. So the idea being that if we are moving towards um, greater alignment with the rest of the university, well what do we think that looks like? And I think that those expectations are important for how we position ourselves responding to um, a, a new culture. So. Um, the an important context for this is that just before the research or two years before there was um, a policy change in the in the institution whereby EA practitioners automatically were allocated a certain amount of time for scholarship and in the language of uh, one of the management uh, the idea of this was to create a dynamic culture in which issues of language learning and teaching are explored and, and discussed. So um, in essence, um, 
all of the EAP practitioners would automatically have half a day a week to dedicate to scholarship projects of their choice. If they were, if they had more ambitious scholarship projects or could make a case for additional time, then uh, they could have a full day a week. So this was a very, very significant change in the in the institution. I interviewed um, 12 of the EAP practitioners. Uh, the, I wanted them to have at least three years teaching experience. Um, I, um, I want in the institution, so I didn't want them to be going through probation or learning learning the ropes in the institution. Um, I didn't want people who or, or colleagues who already had been involved in publishing because I wanted to catch uh, practitioners at the point at which they were responding to this change. But I also wanted to make sure that they were involved in, in, in a project since the policy had been introduced. So I'm going to go quite quickly through some of the data. I have cut it down. Uh, I, try, I wanted to give you enough so you can get a flavour of the data. Um, but if I'm talking through quite quickly, I'll, I'll share the slides with you um, afterwards. So, um, first of all, then we have the idea of um, of status of being taken more seriously in an institution if you're publishing. Um, I like the expression that it's um, it's a marker of educational achievement um, if you are publishing and. Um, there is a Jeep paper which uh, I've written which explains this research in more detail, but I'm using a large, uh, a kind of broad definition of scholarship, so including blogs, for example, uh, rather than just the um, research assessment exercise uh, level publications. What happens in this change? Uh, I like this. Uh, the uh, this quote here. I don't want to call myself a lecturer yet, even though in the institution for quite some time uh, the EAP practitioners had had the choice to move from a uh, teaching fellow. But for this uh, participant, maybe if I did manage to publish things, that would change how I view myself in the centre or the university as a whole, not of more of not just a teacher. So I like this idea of like the uh, the label of lecturer there for anybody to claim uh, was something that they wanted to to earn, and this was attached to uh, being more academic by publishing, which is an academic activity. Um, so in the quote below, there you can see then that. In, a think, in the thinking about a movement towards practices in the wider university, there's, if not exactly a resistance, but a, a, a demarcation, which is, in the, which is in the minds of one or two of the participants of being a teacher and, and being comfortable with this, and the thinking about the implications of being asked to conduct scholarship. Um, I just point out there was no obligation to be writing um, uh, to be publication for this um, scholarship, but for a number of the participants, it seemed to be implied there. So um, the publication as a an obligation working in a university. So participants beginning to think about well, if about closer alignment and how that might bring in some of the responsibilities that uh, of, the, of the wider economy. Um, again, um, the respect in the wider community which, uh, which accompanies publication in the minds of the participants. Um, and then perhaps the the kind of associations which seem to be dominant before this policy was introduced um, of being language assistants in many minds, so um, connotations there of VAP practitioners as part of a uh, as a, a service um, of a kind of as, as an add-on, um, provide just providing support and to help. Um, and I like the other, the the next one because um, it begins to open up uh, status 
in different ways that uh, not just with the wider university but also with your own colleagues if you're a course leader then if you're published then it perhaps provides the credibility uh, that you might uh, that might make you feel more comfortable in that role and similarly here you can see that in terms of working with students uh, and guide uh, explaining about doing uh, uh, conducting scholarship and research to students possibly including uh, doctoral students that uh, one of the practitioners felt that it would give them more kudos um, in, in that role if they'd already published um, themselves and equally with the quotation below and then I've just taken one or two short elements of data for the second question which just to remind you is uh, thinking about the the activity and scholarship activity in the uh, wider university so um, the in the in and this is the department that the, the EAP practitioner was seconded to they're encouraged to have a certain amount of output in terms of academic publications so already then the participants were um, bringing to mind ideas that they were or examples that they're aware of where people had to uh, present their publications for REF and uh, we'll all know that these are very pressured situations funding for departments is um, contingent on uh, these uh, the right publications the right level of publications and the grants which um, which have been won by by academics um, so the pressure to publish and publish in the right places is also mentioned by practitioner eight but and this is the last slide of the data um, in the interview data there were also perhaps more nuanced uh, responses and practitioner one for example begins to talk about um, um, how the, the range of activity which might constitute scholarship so people seem to fluctuate between expecting the top end referable stuff um, uh, often for full-time research staff and being more practical in terms of an impact on student education within the university and so this is then thinking more about the kind of scholarship uh, which is teaching and learning related within the wider university as one of the management uh, participants mentioned and I'll read this out in full because uh, I think it is important there's a myth that what goes on in the rest of the university is always high powered single authored articles that they churn out in some cases that's clearly the case the stereotype of the professor who doesn't teach and just writes but the teaching and learning community who we're more aligned with includes academics in law education whoever it might be I think the kind of things that we collectively produce are easily on a par with the things that they do um, so that's a very quick summary then of some of the points that we might draw from that um, we have a, um, a dichotomy being uh, created between academics and teachers and the participants were clearly thinking about themselves moving along a trajectory more towards like, uh, towards being uh, um, academics um, perhaps not just in the data that I've limited here but there were questions of core EAP activity what do we really do are we really teachers should we be conducting um, scholarship is it core activity is it an add-on but also in terms of uh, strengthening professional activity there's questions of, of credibility internally but also regards as regards the wider university so I think because a lot of elements of professional identity do seem to come through from uh, comparisons and positioning ourselves um, regarding uh, other academics in the in the institution so certainly there were some beliefs around the um, nature of 
written outputs in the wider academy that they were all high impact and that they were all uniform. Um, however, there were also voices pointing out that actually there's a there's a wide diversity of written outputs and within the a university. Simon, we got for, yeah, for everybody. Shall we just wait a minute and see whether? Yeah, maybe he's coming mm -hmm. back. Oh, there oh. we go. There he is. Yeah, yeah. I, got a, I got a message saying it's crashed, so apologies for that. Um, but that that pretty much does bring me to the end. I'll just come to the final slide. If um, so, there's some some anxiety over this because um, scholarship writing, or well, the allocation scholarship did bring certain expectations that there would be scholarship publication would follow on from this, even though. As part of this research, I went through all of the policy documents. Um, uh, there was never any suggestion that um, um, EAP practitioners needed to uh, to publish. And if there's been encouragement, even two years on, there's certainly no obligation. But what I was particularly interested in this it was that um, even um, um, two years after the introduction of this policy, there was what I refer to as a normalization of scholarship writing, that there were there were examples appearing of people who'd published, um, of uh, people who were writing blogs, who'd become involved in writing, who had invitations to write book chapters as part of, um, and were writing for an internal journal. And it wasn't just that the participants were beginning to think about this, um, and had plans, but they were all aware of people in their environment, people who perhaps they'd started in the institution with, who were already um, planning and involved in these uh, publications. So as part of this, we can see a shift from being a predominantly teaching identity towards a more academic one. Um, um, Alex Ding and uh, Ian Bruce have talked uh, a lot about this. Um, what I wanted to do with this research was to provide some empirical data uh, to look at this. Um, here, the, when you look at the um, other research, there's often a, a, re a resistance to the impos imposition of publication requirements where they've in, been introduced um, externally. This wasn't the case here. And one of the things, if you're interested in how um, how that this change came about, is that there's a lot of agency exercised by the practitioners. So examples would be practitioners going for easier hits, writing for the in-house journal before a book chapter, for example, or writing a blog, or working um, in um, group projects, which perhaps had a more kind of experienced member of staff uh, leading them. So there's some references in here, um, including the publication I mentioned, which is uh, goes into this in more detail. Thanks, everyone. I apologize if I did go over time. I, I cut it down to make it shorter. I also do need to, I mentioned this to Angelos uh, earlier. I will need to leave before we go into the breakout rooms, I'm afraid, because we've got a summer program meters meeting, which um, I really do need to be part of. So mm -hmm. uh, if we've got well, thank a few you. minutes thank beforehand, you, that'd be fine, yeah? Yeah. So if, if anyone has any uh, questions for Simon before he, he, leave us, uh, he leaves us, then by all means. Yeah. I did see the question asking for the, uh, just asking about the 
the university. I don't think it's any great secret that it was um, here in Leeds. Um, <laughs> and I think the fact that at, at Bar Leap, the 18 of us went, 14 people were presenting with uh, three people presenting twice. I think this, this I've been here 20 years, represented uh, represents a really radical change in terms of the way that the role, the, um, the presence of scholarship activity in the institution as a result. Mm. Yeah. Simon, can I ask if all your participants were from Leeds? Yes. Okay. So are this yeah. some sort of let's say bias or subjectivity in your case, because you are an institution that promotes this kind of uh, scholarship and engagement in scholarship. So you're, they were not very objective, I guess, your participants when they're talking about scholarship, being an institution that promotes actually this kind of culture, working culture. Um, yeah. Well, I think if you have a look at the paper, you'll see that it, it, it's reasonably balanced. and. Um, I did have a um, a research buddy from another institution, mm -hmm. and I was going through the data analysis as part of this to try. I'm not sure there's going to bias there because in the in, in the data we see a, a range of responses, mm -hmm. but actually the fact that people were talking about their projects and some of them have made commitments to kind of write or trying or working with colleagues um, in order to develop their writing. Um, I'm not sure if I would say it was biased. Um, um, I did see a pattern and I generalized yeah. in that pattern. So I mean, no, I mean, biased in terms of the reporting. I said bias, biased in terms of it would be much more, let's say, kind of like objective to have some participants from another institution, from other institutions that they do not have this, let's say, privilege or allowance or encouragement. Oh, control to, group, yeah. right. Yeah. Yes, I mean, in a way, even though it's not longitudinal research, I'm taking yeah. a, a longitudinal sweep and yeah. the, the data um, that I include, perhaps more in the, in the paper, includes a lot of references from the participants themselves to, to change. So I suppose that if um, the starting point or the control, the, the equivalent of a control group will be the starting point where there was little encouragement for um, for scholarship engagement. Um, doesn't mean that nobody was involved, but there was, um, in, in terms of the participants, there was, there was um, um, a very, very noticeable change in terms of activity. Okay. Yeah. There's a question from Stefan, I think. Um, hi, yeah, thank you, Simon, um, for that. This is really kind of speaks very much to me because I'm very much in this in this position of kind of feeling like I want to write and, and, and do scholarship um, in my role. I was wondering what your thoughts were on the kind of the diversity of the professional backgrounds of a lot of EAP tutors in that, I mean, I don't have a PhD, for example, I'm hoping to start one soon, whether that kind of that feeling of coming from different um, you know, teaching backgrounds and perhaps not having high high academic qualifications is a reason behind yeah. that kind of nervousness That's, about con contributing yeah. to, to publications. It's a great question actually. If you see in the references, if you see the paper mm. by Mary Davis, 2019, oh, yes. and yeah. um, She's I, mean, I found that actually. <laughs> all right, well it's a very inspiring paper and um, um, I think it made a really useful contribution. Um, but the, the participants there um, were all researchers or had a research background, they all had PhDs or working mm -hmm. towards a PhD. And one of the arguments I made in my paper is that it didn't, uh, to my mind, fully represent the majority of the, certainly didn't represent the majority in the institution that I was working in, where it, it tended to be more MA, uh, deltas, etc. So, so less prepared. Uh, um, I think that's fair to say because, you know, doing PhDs, inevitably you have research modules, etc. and you have, um, it doesn't mean it's a preserve of people who've been through that route. Mm. So this is like very much an argument I make and um, all of the, so none of the participants had PhDs and that was one of, specifically one of the criteria. As it is, I don't think at the time um, there might have been one or two people in the whole department I think what happens with the change of, of scholarship culture, though, 
is that in recent years, recent years, last two, possibly three years since we've had this policy, um, it's been attractive and lots of the new, uh, newly recruited uh, colleagues do have PhDs because they're coming specifically thinking, okay, good, this is scholarship rich and this kind of activity is um, encouraged. So it's a really useful question. So thank you for that. Um, yes, there is, there's lots of, there's lots of like uh, support and um, uh, thinking about doing research in groups, uh, workshops, looking at research methodologies. Um, um, you'll notice also we had in with the Bali Res Tez uh, research method sessions, and I think we're trying to be part of this kind of culture as well. Yeah. And also okay. there's PhD by publication, isn't there? That kind of route as well. So if you did want to become active, uh, that that's a possibility. That's recognised. I think that's that's a good thing. I'll, yeah. sorry, I'll pass over now. I know there's another question. Yes, two more questions. One from Penny first, and then from Anthony. Penny. So uh, you, the University of Leeds is like a quite unique university in terms of scholarship and everything. Are you thinking of doing like of expanding this kind of research, finding out which other universities have this kind of culture? That would be really, really interesting. I don't know if you're aware of that. So Leeds, yeah. maybe Reading has this kind of culture. What other universities have this, you know, scholarship mindset? Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, I really enjoyed the conversations at the um, at the conferences and at the PIMS about this. In terms of doing the research, um, I think I'm going to leave that for someone like younger and hungrier um, to <laughs> to do the broader research. What what I'm thinking about doing um, as a follow up to this is to to do ethnographic research now, looking at the institutional culture as it is now now that things have really moved on and uh we've had like you know a lot of colleagues a lot of those people who i uh, interviewed as part of the research have now uh, written we've got lots of established academics uh had a series of edited books with a lot of um uh colleagues uh from the center have been involved in um, and so I'm thinking more now about how to to capture this scholarship rich culture now and the kind of the way it's uh, affecting um, professional identity a bit further on because it was still very kind of wasn't quite as established as it might have been uh, when when I first undertook this so uh, it's a great it's a great suggestion um, and uh, I suppose if um, if there were a network of people in different institutions who wanted to conduct such research, I'd certainly be open to that. Yeah. Um, Anthony, very good question, Simon, and thank you for your presentation. It's really interesting Thanks. and pertinent. Um, okay. How many international students do you have on campus? Ah, well, I'll know that after being to this next meeting. <laughs> um, you mean year round? Yeah, so like you know, at TSA we've got six thousand international students uh, on in sessional, per in sessional, but and pre sessional, obviously eventually filtering it into in sessional. But just Gosh. because we, you know, we we've we've all we've looked at what you guys have been doing over the last couple of years, and we use what you do to leverage. Where I, I work at yeah. TSA with Agalos, and um, these are the kinds of things of, about scale as well that are important. We've got an informal Friday afternoon. That we give our staff for professional development, but right. pushing to something that's more formalised, it's always useful to know in terms of numbers what other institutions are doing and how they're doing it, and thinking about scale. So that's the, the background of the question. Yeah, I mean, rather than student numbers, I can tell you that uh, our year-round, our, our full-time teaching staff is about seventy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, although we have 
programs running Southwest Chow Tung in China, etc. Some of them might be involved in that. But if you're looking for an idea of scale, I am, yeah, that's like, like seven that, times, 70, 75. Seven yeah. times larger than us. But it's, it's, you know, as I say, thank you for that. And uh, as I say, we yeah. do use your institution as a, as a beacon of, of how we want to organise ourselves. So thank you for all the work that you do. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. And it was part of my um, motivation for following this up was precisely so that, because I, I feel that, you know, well, I gave the example of the recent Bali conference just to say, you know, that there is a lot of activity. And with this Jeep paper, one or two people did contact me to say that they put it forward to senior management mm -hmm. as an example of exactly. um, of what might change, but it was, you know, it, it was yeah. at an early stage. And I thought, well, what would happen if, you know, I was trying to capture what's happening now, uh, where there's been, um, it's not just this activity, it's, um, it's the, uh, the role that EAP practitioners are playing, in it, are playing in the wider university, because with the TEF framework, the kind of research we're doing mm -hmm. is going down really, really well. Yeah. Um, and also the fact that it's there have been um, quite dramatic changes in our own programs because of the research that's uh, taking place. So um, I th as exactly as you say, I was like thinking, well, this is you know, something that could be taken forward in other institutions might be useful. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, I apologize again. Um, that no, no worries. I, I'll make uh, a final comment about Simon and the University of Leeds and then what Penny said. Uh, uh, while I was at the Bali conferences myself, you know, with Daniela and um, Stephanie, I had a quick look at the profiles of people presenting because there were kind of like three columns with uh, presenters and at the DIS who were, you know, uh, created profiles online. So I ran a, a quick search on people presenting and I found that it was the University of Leeds and the University of Glasgow who had more than 10 people presenting. So 10 members of staff from Leeds, more than 10, and Glasgow, they, those were the dominant, let's say, institutions with presenters at Valley Conference. It means something for those institutions, I would say. Yeah. And that, that, that was my comment. Great. And the, the only other thing I would say, um, Anthony, is if you've, um, if you've got the, um, if there already is time which is allocated to, um, for for scholarship nominally then um um the if you, if you have a look at the the paper i've written it mentions it briefly but uh either i or kind of alex ding could perhaps give you some more meat on this it's just, just thinking about the um a framework of support there was a lot of talk about scholarship and what it might look like to make it not to uh, seem to um, challenging lots of like uh, groups which were kind of set up internal training and support mentoring etc so um, I think building this up and the references I put there kind of of some of the dangers of kind of imposing this where there's uh, uh, resistance and anxiety to the change I think is also where I think our own institution where um, um, Cho chose a kind of a very well considered path because we've kind of got to probably where they where they envisage, but without any um, obligations being uh, being imposed. So thanks everyone. I'll thank you. Thank you so much. Who wants to email me with any other questions? Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Man.